Hello, welcome. How's everyone doing today? Good to see everyone. My name is TJ. I'm the program coordinator here at uh, Rancho Mirage Library and Observatory. It's great to welcome you all. How many out there have never been here? Is this or your first program? Well, welcome. Oh, quite a few. So a great turnout today. Uh, obviously a very interesting and popular topic. So um, I won't take up too much time, but I just wanted to uh, say thank you to the Friends of the Desert Mountains for this uh, partnership. It's been great. We're looking at what we can do together in the future. And also let everyone know that uh, we're really in the midst of our programming uh, season right now. We've got a lot of great things coming up, including something every single day this week, actually. So tomorrow we've got a lecture uh, with Bob Klein. Uh, he's a film producer, and he's going to talk about an interview he did with Grace Kelly. Uh, and it was actually the week before she passed away. So fascinating interview. Um, Wednesday night, the Rancho Mirage Emergency Preparedness Commission has a town hall, so come join us for that. Uh, and then Thursday evening, uh, we have uh, the band actually was on the cover of our current program guide, Jessica Ficho and her band. Uh, so we're really looking forward to them. They haven't been here before, but they look fascinating. She plays the accordion and a toy piano. So I cannot wait to see what that's like, but it should be a great show uh, and comes highly recommended. So, uh, And then on Friday, we have one of our uh, Make It Take It programs for uh, kids and families. So there's, there's something going on every day. Um, so you can grab one of these, but I've also just been told by Aaron, our director, that the new one, which is March, April, May, might be here by the time this program is over. The truck was on the way. So if it's here, we'll have them. Otherwise, tomorrow, come in and pick one up. We'll be sending out electronic copies if you're on our email list as well. Uh, so, again, welcome everyone, and with that, I'm going to hand things over to Ada Knuckles, lead volunteer for Friends of the Desert Mountains. Welcome, everybody, and for all of you standing in the back, there's plenty of seats down here in front. You can just come on down. So... Welcome, uh, I am a volunteer with Friends of the Desert Mountains. Friends of the Desert Mountains is a conservation, land conservation group. We are celebrating 35 years this year, and we have many, many programs that we are offering. Uh, our calendar of events is quite full for this month and next month, but just to give you a highlight of a couple of things that we're gonna be doing, uh, this Saturday night, we will be having uh, music in the gardens at El Paseo, uh, great band, so go online and buy your tickets for that. Next, the following Saturday, the 25th, we're going to have our fun run to kick off our wildflower week ahead of time, so sign up online for that also. We also have um, the... Wildflower Festival at Palm Desert Civic Center Park on Saturday, March 4th. So we have lots of things going on that everybody can attend. But back to who friends are. They have been in business since 1987, buying land to keep it as desert so that you can enjoy what the reasons are that you moved here to the desert. We are part of the Santa Rosa, San Jacinto Mountains National Monument. Our volunteers support them, uh, the government employees. Do, how many people knows where the National Monument is located? A few of you. So the National Monument, everybody knows where Mount San Jacinto is out here on the west end of the valley. You know that big tall mountain with all the snow on it? So if you start there with your hand in front of the mountain and just follow the mountains as if you were going to Highway 86, going to Salton Sea, you will see the 282,000 acres of land that comprises the National Monument. So the National Monument was signed into legislation by President Bill Clinton in October of 2000. So we... Uh, have uh, four employees for the National Monument, and so the BLM takes care of the desert side, and the Forest Service takes care of the upper elevations of it. So with only four employees, our 150 volunteers do a lot of work to take care of it. So after that, I'm going to trade off and let you know about our speaker today, Oscar Ortiz 
is a young man that grew up here in uh, Indio, graduated from Indio High School, went on to Stanford to get his degree in chemistry. He also eventually became a board member for Friends of the Desert Mountains and then decided he wanted to be our employee and he is now in charge of our uh, education program. He is also working with the Torres Martinez tribal people to get a land, a piece of property that Friends of the Desert Mountains owns down in Coachella. We're trying to make it a cultural education center. So please welcome Oscar and give him a round on the water topic today. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Good to see you all. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ada, for the introduction. And thank you to the library for having us today. Really appreciate the time. So yeah, I'm Oscar Ortiz, a Director of Education for Friends of the Desert Mountains. I joined the team last year as an employee. And as Ada mentioned, I was on the board for two years as a board member as well. And today we're going to be talking about the very important topic these days of water here in the Coachella Valley. So today we're going to be talking about generally where does our water come from, uh, where does it go, uh, some drought issues that we're seeing, other environmental issues, and how we can help. Also, we do want it to be a little bit interactive, so we'll be asking a few questions from the audience to see, um, you know, to see what ideas are coming from the audience and see where everybody's at and where we can uh, push forward. So the first question we have for the audience is, where does our water come from? What sources do we have uh, of water here in the Coachella Valley? And how does it make it to our homes? Does anybody have some ideas? Colorado River, Colorado River is one of them. Snow runoff, Snow runoff aquifer. Sacramento Delta. Delta, sometimes it comes all the way down from the State Water Project too, right? So the second question we have is, where is our water going? How is it being used in the Coachella Valley? Golf courses is one of them. Our homes. Toilets, yes, toilets as well. <laughs> agriculture is a big one, right? We know agriculture is huge here in the Coachella Valley. What was that one? Golf courses, yes. All right, so let's look at all of our inlets here. We do have water coming from our Whitewater River. It, you know, when the snow falls and, and rain falls on the San Gorgonio Mountains, it, it makes its way down through the, color, uh, through the, through the uh, Whitewater River. We also have the All-American Canal coming from the Colorado River, and we have underground water from our aquifer, and we also have some recycled water, right? We have a few recycling projects here in the Coachella Valley that also give us a supply of water. Our outlets, agriculture is a huge one, right? We're, we're a big producer in the Coachella Valley of fruits and vegetables, so a lot of our water does get consumed by agriculture. Uh, drinking water, business, residential use, our toilets as well, yeah. <laughs> And then we also have, um, our soil will also absorb a lot of the water that we use, whether it's in agriculture or golf courses. Sometimes that makes it all the way down to the aquifer as well. And we also have our aquifer, which is about 39 million acre feet of water, I believe. And then we also have the salt and sea, right? Some of our water uh, will make it all the way down to the salt and sea. Sometimes, you know, when we see a lot of rainfall and we see um, the the Whitewater River watershed kind of gets filled up, right, filled up, right, and we see it traveling through the Coachella Valley. Eventually, it'll make it all the way down to the uh, Salton Sea there. And first, we want to start off with a unit of measurement that we're going to be using a lot today, which is very common in the world of water. That's one acre foot. So one acre foot of water, it's a, it's a volume, and so it's about one acre of land, sorry, uh, one acre of area and about one foot deep. So about one football field, one foot deep, that's one acre foot of water. So here we see uh, our water demand is coming from, about 50% is coming from the agricultural use. You see that in the green there. Under that, you'll see the urban use. It's about another 50%. And so we're kind of in between, right? Most, some of it's going to agriculture, about half. About half is being used in our neighborhoods, in our golf courses, and through city use there. Where's that water coming from? Uh, 287,000 acre feet. 
per year is coming from canal water. We're also using 285,000 acre feet of groundwater. And that little sliver on top that you see in purple, that's the recycled water that's coming back from our recycling plants. So <laughs> not a whole lot, but we can do better. And we do see some efforts, especially in the Los Angeles area, of recycled water projects coming online. So we'll talk first about the Whitewater River. So this, as we mentioned before, is bringing in water from the melted snow and rainfall from the San Gorgonio Mountains. Also brings water from the uh, Colorado River Aqueduct, which is a, a deal that we have with uh, Los Angeles where we exchange water there. And so depending on our water supply uh, throughout the state, that uh, um, allocation that we have with the state will vary. So last year, it was a very dry year. We only got 5% of our allocation because of how dry the conditions were all over the state. This year, they're expecting about 30%. Still low, right? It's still not, it's only a third of, of what we're expecting, but it got a little better this year with the rainfall that we've seen uh, recently. So most of this water here will end up in those, um, those ponds that we have out near Desert Hot Springs, the spreading ponds, and that'll be filtered back into the aquifer through those ponds. Those ponds have like a very, it, it, there's no clay in those, in those layers of sand, so the water is able to travel down into our aquifer in those areas. Uh, recycled water is coming from our, our sewer system. It's used mostly in landscaping, so there's different levels of recycling water. Uh, we use it to the level where it's good enough to put on the landscaping, not good enough to drink, right? That would be another step, pretty expensive step, so you really don't see much of that going on. It's usually just purified to the point where you can use it in agriculture or use it in uh, landscaping. Uh, we produce here about 14,000 acre feet per year. And a uh, reminder here is that we want to be careful with what we flush because uh, that water and, and those materials eventually make it to these recycling plants. And if there's anything besides toilet paper that's in that water, it can cause issues in the machinery, it can cause issues with the maintenance. And so it's going to be more expensive for us and more tedious for our workers to be able to purify that water. So always make sure that you're only flushing uh, toilet paper down the toilet. Even those wipes that say they're flushable, they're not. You know, according to the water um, districts, do not flush those, please. And you'll see there the three different stages of, of water purification there. And there on your right is going to be uh, one of the treatment facilities here for CVWD. If you've ever been there, it doesn't smell great, but it's awesome. <laughs> Here in purple, you'll, you'll see all the landscaping that uses actually the recycled water that we're producing here in the Coachella Valley. So it's a good amount, right? Even though it's not a lot of water that we're producing compared to how much we consume, we're at least getting, getting somewhere here. Our aquifer, uh, very important, right? Uh, we treasure it very much. We know we have a, a great tasting water here in the Coachella Valley. And so that's kind of an underground storage system. This is where our drinking water and our residential water comes from. And so that water is stored in between rocks and soil in the ground. I like to think of it as a big bathtub, right? So if you fill the bathtub, it's not empty, right? It's not just water in there. It's like if you fill the bathtub with rocks and some sediment and smaller rocks, there's still room for water in between there, right? If you pour water in, it'll still fill up. So that's kind of what it's like. It's full of rocks and sediment down there, but there's still large volumes of water that are able to fit uh, in our aquifer. And so what our, what our pumps do is reach out in, into that sediment and extract the water from there. So uh, right now it holds about 39 million acre feet of water and 2 million acre feet have been refilled since 1973. So about 650 billion gallons of water have been uh, refilled into that system. And so this, it kind of, I, I, I feel like working, you know, w within these departments sometimes, it gives us a little bit of, uh, we're very confident that we're okay with water, but if you start looking at the math, if we didn't have that Colorado River water, that water is going to be start moving pretty quickly there, right? So, and we know how that's going with the Colorado River, so that's why we need to start making changes now before we get cut off from that supply. Um, do you have any questions? Any pressing questions at the moment? No, not grew by two million. No, it was refilled. So we've been using up a lot of water. And the amount that's been put back in with the Colorado River is that amount that I gave you. Question? How deep is the, How deep is the aquifer? I'm not sure, honestly. Yeah. I think it depends on where you're at. 
but I'm not exactly sure. But we will talk a little bit more about the levels of the aquifer in a little bit. Question here. Yes, and we will talk a little bit more about the agricultural uh, fixes. So one of the one of the big fixes that th this gentleman's pointing out is that we've uh, changed a lot of our agriculture from the sprinklers to the uh, drip irrigation to avoid that evaporation. Right, as the water, tra especially when it's very hot, even just that couple of seconds that it's traveling through the air in those thin layers, it'll evaporate and leave before it gets to the to our uh, plants. And so a lot of that change has happened. And ev even with the flood irrigation, right? Before there used to be a lot of flood irrigation, and we see a lot of that changing now to that drip irrigation, um, especially with how, how more how much more expensive it is to water these days. People are starting to get on track with those programs. One more. That that was only human effort, I believe. That's through our ponds that we have that are filtering back into the ground. All right. One more in the back. And that's a great point, right, that we still have a lot of new development coming along. We still see a lot of golf courses, a lot of lawns in our communities. And really, that's going to come through the community, right? For me, I'm depending on the community, which is why we're doing these education efforts, right, to get everybody involved, get you out there to those city council meetings and start letting uh, the cities and other responsible parties know that we, we need to make some changes quickly. And we need to look at these equations. I'm a big math guy, so I look at the equations, right? <laughs> Show me that that equation is going to last for a long time. And right now, I'm not confident that that's how it's looking. But we'll go ahead and move on to the Salton Sea. So currently, at the Salton Sea, we see about 7 million acre feet of water. Uh, for thousands of years, the flow from Colorado River would fill up the ancient Lake Cahuilla up until about 500 years ago. And so you see there on the, on the right-hand side, uh, the Salton Sea is dark blue. Ancient Lake Cahuilla is the light blue that you'll see up there. So for a long time, uh, the lake would fill up to those levels, right, naturally. And it would go back and forth. It would dry up, and it would fill back up. And so sometimes one of the things that I, I heard before was that the Salton Sea is a man-made accident, right? And so it, it was an accident after they had dammed it up. But before that dam, before the Hoover Dam and all the dams on the Colorado River, it flowed here naturally. So I think that's kind of false, right, that it's not really – it was a natural forming lake for a long time and still, until we stopped – uh, that water flow from coming down. And so you'll see where the yellow arrow is. That's where the the Colorado River would divert. So a silt would build up and eventually build like a wall there and it would change course and go to the Salton Sea. And then after an amount of time, it would go back to the Sea of Cortez. And so it would alternate between those two uh, bodies of water for a long time. Sure, quick question. Yes. Yes, and, and we will talk about that in the next couple of slides here. Uh, so this uh, body of water, it brought a lot of natural resources, brought in fish and other natural resources to native communities for thousands of years, right? And so that's why if we go out, um, have you guys seen the lines? Everybody's seen the lines right on the mountains where you could see where the water line used to be at. And so that water used to come all the way past, you know, the cove area. And so if you go out into thermal and to some of those areas where the water line used to reach up to, you'll see fish traps there. And so these fish traps were made, handmade by Native American communities where they would build these circles there of rocks. And that would capture the fish during the tides. So in high tide, the fish would be swimming around. Low tide, they would get stuck in between those rocks. And that was one method they used for fishing. So in 1873, that's when the levees were built on the Colorado River, reducing those flows to the Salton Sea. 
uh, for a brief period of time, salt and sea was used for salt mining. In 1905, those levees break and fill the sea partially. And you know, through colonization and continued construction here in the Coachella Valley, we start seeing more and more of a demand for water to keep up with the growing uh, development here and growing agriculture. And so the water supplies, we used to have artesian wells, right, where the water flows naturally up over the ground. And they started seeing that there was changes, that those artesian wells were not producing anymore. And it, it signified to them that our water levels were, were receding. So in 1942, uh, the All-American Canal was built. Uh, brings in about 300,000 acre feet of water every year from the Colorado River. This water is mainly used for irrigation in the Imperial Valley and the Coachella Valley. And the runoff from that irrigation, as was mentioned earlier, a lot of that runoff ends up going to the Salton Sea from that agriculture. So here's just a few pictures of that canal, in case any of you, any of you haven't seen it up close. These are the percolation ponds, so the spreading ponds where the water will filter down back into the aquifer. And this is also the spreading pond there. So that's the water coming in from the river and spreading out over the ground and going back into our aquifer. So some diversion consequences. Uh, what are some of the impacts that you can think of to the environment as we use up water from the Colorado River? Anybody have any ideas here? No more electricity. If that water runs out, then yes, we will see a reduction in electricity. And we'll talk about those levels here pretty soon as well. Water shortage. No more irrigation. So some of the consequences, you know, effects on the Colorado River Delta, right? We're deeply impacting that system that used to travel to the Sea of Cortez. So with less water going to the sea, less nutrients will also go to the sea. So right now about 15 dams are built on the main stem of the river, hundreds more on the smaller parts of the river that are branching off of that. We'll also see drier conditions in natural habitats and habitat loss, right? Uh, also, when we build those dams, we know we're also affecting the migration of certain species there, right? Uh, fish that cannot swim back up or can't swim down to where they're supposed to go. Uh, we're also seeing our salt and sea drying up exposing the toxic lake bed. As was mentioned before, for you know over 100 years, that water was going into the farms and the runoff was going into the sea. And we know 100 years ago, there was a lot different chemicals that were not regulated yet, right? DDT and all these other pesticides that were used for long periods of time. And so a lot of that buildup ended up at the Salton Sea for decades and decades. So now as that sea is drying up, that's why there's so much, um, there's so much focus on keeping that, that dirt down, right? The, the problem is that as it dries up, that dirt is able to be lifted up by the wind. And as, a, as that wind uh, lifts up that dirt, it spreads it throughout the surrounding communities. And that's why we see the health impacts that we're seeing now around the Salton Sea in those areas, oasis, thermal. We're seeing higher rates of, of um, asthma, uh, certain uh, cancer, uh, other respiratory problems in that population. So, and a lot of those are also farm workers and they're still working within the pesticides, right? So they'll go work in the pesticide, in pesticide environments and then still live with, you know, all these toxic chemicals around them as well. So I think both of those are probably having a very severe impact on the health there. So as the sea dries up, another thing to remember is that water will evaporate, but a lot of those chemicals and the salt will remain. And that's why you see a higher concentration of salt now as the water's uh, receding it's becoming more and more concentrated with some of these chemicals and the salt levels are, are a lot higher now. So the current state of the salt and sea, it's drying up, leaving the toxic lake bed exposed. Salt and pollutants are concentrating as water evaporates. And by 2028, it's estimated that 60,000 acres of the lake bed is expected to be exposed. Currently, we do have the 10 year management plan being run by the state and the county. And that is planning on covering 30,000 uh, acres of a lake bed with dust mitigation efforts. So about half of what we're expecting to be exposed by 2028, half of that will be taken care of with the 10-year management plan, but we know that there's still gonna be more work, right? And so uh, some of the methods to mitigate that, that dust, to keep that dust down is building some small ponds and marshes, 
uh, building a perimeter lake and using shrubs and hay barrels to slow down the wind. And we'll see some of that here soon. You have a question? What is a perimeter lake? Perimeter lake, so that would be, I believe what that is here is a natural, sorry, not natural, um, that's water from our aquifer that they will use to fill up a lake that fills up the perimeter of the Salton Sea. So we know a lot of the lake bed exposes around the perimeter. So what they're doing is filling that up with water as well. Yes, correct. Only a portion of it will be the perimeter lake. Question? Uh, that's a good question. What impact will lithium mining have? And I don't think we truly know the answer to that yet because we haven't really been told what method of extraction is being used. They're saying it's a new method that's cleaner than older methods, but I haven't seen any numbers, you know, what, what kind of process is being done there. Next lecture. No, I'm just kidding. It, she's saying that it potentially could create more dust, right, as they're thinking up all this lithium, that that is one of the issues that we see coming forward is more. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll, we'll keep track on that, too, and follow up as well and see where those conversations are going. So in 2003, the state took over the planning for the long-term solutions at the Salton Sea. Uh, currently, they're looking at pr proposed long-term projects that are going to be able to take care of some of these issues past the 10-year plan and helping to narrow down a decision. The Army Corps of Engineers is also involved now. They're beginning a three-year study, and this could potentially bring 65% uh, of funding for any proposed solution to the Salton Sea. So that's kind of exciting there. It could lead up to hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. So we'll see where that goes. This is some of the work that's currently being done. So you'll see here on the left is the, a channel that they're building next to the berm, a deep channel. And then on the right, you'll see a nesting island. So we know that a lot of the, the birds that uh, populate the Salton Sea area like to lay eggs in uh, islands. And so they're trying to recreate some of those habitats to encourage a repopulation of those species. This is also one of the methods that they're currently using to keep the dust down. And so they're planning on growing native plants uh, around those areas they're gonna be exposed to, they're gonna have the lake bed exposed. And what that would do is, is use the plants to keep the dust down as the winds come through. So hopefully that'll prevent it from uh, spreading so much into the surrounding communities. And uh, the barrels of hay, to my understanding, what they're being used for is to calm the winds so that those plants can grow and, and get strong before they're exposed to those high winds that they're seeing out there in the Salton Sea. Uh, I'm not sure about Owens Lake. I think somebody's... Sorry, I can't really hear you there. At Lake Owens? Is that the same method that they're using there? Oh, okay, gotcha could be, yeah, I'm not too sure about Owens Lake there. These are some of the agreements that were done uh, previously for how much water each state was going to be taking from the Colorado River. And that's in 1,000 acre feet per year. So um, we see there in California, it says 4,600. That's really 4 million, uh, 4 million 600,000 acre feet uh, per year. And we know now, you know, this, uh, when we've done the calculations for how much water is left in the river, right, to go to the delta, there's not much. This is really all of it. We really took all of the water and split it up between all the states and Mexico so that to the point where there's really not much going uh, out to the sea anymore. And, you know, now we know that these, this is kind of the negotiations that are going on now, right, with IID and the other states and California and the other states and seeing what are the new numbers going to be and we'll, we're keeping an eye on that too because that's gonna affect, potentially affect how much water we get from the Colorado River to be able to refill our aquifer. Uh, it is also affecting the Sea of Cortez. I'm not really sure how, but you know, with all that lack of water going there and lack of nutrients, I'm sure it's had an impact over the past couple of, year, couple of decades. 
Uh, here is a picture. Do you guys know what this is? Lake Mead, right? So Lake Mead, uh, we're seeing a great reduction there of the water. And so this is America's largest reservoir. It holds water from the Colorado River for disbursement to, to some of the more southern states where it goes to. It's at its lowest level since being filled in 1937. In the summer of 2022, it was only at 27% capacity, and it reduced so much that they were starting to find sunken boats and actually bodies from old mob times right near, the, near Las Vegas. And so they actually started resurfacing, and you can look it up. It's true. They, they're finding a lot of, they're closing some cases down there. <laughs> And so uh, during those negotiations for water, there was a determinate, they determined certain numbers that they would, um, that they would follow to, to declare when, when we needed to s slow down some of the consumption of that, of that water. So the tier one shortage is when Lake Mead is below 1075. We've already passed that. And all those states that, that are mentioned there lost a percentage of their water. Tier two, Lake Mead's 1050 feet uh, above sea level that we've already passed that as well. So Arizona took another hit there and Nevada lost a little bit of water. Tier three shortage, we were expected to reach that this July. And that's when California should lose 5% of their water. And so we're uh, getting towards 1038. If we ever reach 895, so it's 150 feet, uh, we, would be, we would not be able to pump water anymore. That's the level that the lake needs to be able to pump water. And so that, you know, they're saying, we're 150 feet away from 25 million Americans losing access to the Colorado River water. Uh, we're gonna, question here. Uh, these, no, I don't think so, no. Yeah, so it's probably filled up a little bit compared since then, but we're still, uh, we're still expecting uh, cut shortages here. Question? I'm not sure how they negotiated that, <laughs> but we're lucky that that was part, part of the negotiation. She's asking, um, why is California the last one to get cut off? And I think it's probably because of population size as well and probably economic uh, production that we were probably given special uh, preference there. So here, looking at our groundwater levels, we're able to see uh, all the inflows to our groundwater, so replenishment, we can see there is 154,000 acre feet. That's how much water we're bringing in from the Colorado River and putting back down into the aquifer. And then we see the return flows from the agriculture and golf courses, municipal water that's returning naturally down into the aquifer as well. On the other side, you'll see uh, we ha do have some net flow to the Salton Sea, and then the groundwater pumping is really taking up a lot of that water, whether it's for um, residential use. Some golf courses are still on groundwater, so that could also be there as well. Question. I don't think that is much of an issue here locally. I haven't really seen that. I think that's more a little bit further west and maybe north a little bit that we see uh, corporations buying large amounts of water. No problem. And so here is a reading from the groundwater levels in Indio. And so this goes from 1970 up till uh, 2020. And so you'll see it was going down for a pretty long time there. And then you'll see that spike up. Any ideas on what that spike up might have been? Conservation? Recharging? Temperature rise? Temperature rise would probably decline it more though, right? Because that's, that's the groundwater levels. Oh, elevation. Oh, no, 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 sorry. So uh, the reason that we see this big uptick was a new replenishment facility in the East Valley that came online in uh, 2009. So you'll see there about 2009 is when you really see that rise, right? So that was an extra percolation area that was um, started in 2009. Where does that water come from? Uh, that water, yeah, it's Colorado River water. That's through CVWD. They're, they started a new percolation area where they're bringing in that Colorado River water and refilling here in the East Valley. Before it was done more in the Desert Hot Springs area. 
So conservation efforts. Question. Yes, so the question is 150 feet, then we, we, we could potentially lose. Uh, you know, I, I don't think we'll get there. I think the, the states will have to agree on something before we get to that point because I think we all lose at that point, right? And so right now they are in negotiation to see who's going to be taking the cuts and where the conservation is going to be happening. Question. Mm -hmm. So the question is, as we see golf course water going back into the aquifer, is that water clean? I think there is enough layers. So far, we haven't really seen any contaminants making it down into the aquifer. So I think it does. Tr it does. But then our ground's probably dirty now, right? So <laughs> yeah, different lecture. There you go. We could do that one, too. No, I'm just kidding. Has anybody considered de desalination plant? I believe there are conversations now about teaming up uh, the U.S. and uh, Mexico, teaming up on some desalination off of the coast of Mexico, and then probably exchanging water there so that we would get more Colorado River water and Mexico would get the desal water. But those are very early stages, so I'm not sure where that's going. Question back there? Water runoff, uh, most of it will end, if there's enough of it, it'll end up at the Salton Sea. Yeah, a lot of it will just infiltrate back into our ground as well, but if there's a lot of it, like that Valentine's Day flood that we had that one time, and we're seeing uh, through, through the, I forget the name of it now, but you know the paved water line that goes through the Coachella Valley, and so that, that carried a lot of water to the Salton Sea that time. And one more question there. So the, qu the question is, how do we capture more of that water into our aquifer when we see those heavy rainfalls, right? And so well, one of the methods that I actually saw recently from, the, from Los Angeles with their turf removal programs, which uh, we see here now too, right? But they require that you incorporate some kind of groundwater recharge into your landscaping. So not only they require also some plants to, to make sure it's not just dry and creating more heat islands, but they'll require some, some uh, percentage of plant coverage and then some percentage of groundwater uh, recharge coverage. So you'll leave an area that's kind of open and might be just be like rocks or something that's going to help capture uh, water back into the aquifer. We're also thinking of those on city level projects as well. Uh, we'll go on to conservation efforts. So how can we reduce our water use? And I'll go ahead and go into it. Uh, something I mentioned earlier with agriculture, uh, drip irrigation has been a great improvement for us in being able to save some of our water in agriculture, especially out here in the desert. There's some new greenhouse technologies that can also help uh, with reducing uh, water use for very water intensive um, plants and, and crops there. At home, you know, our appliances are huge. Lawns are, are a huge thing. Uh, you know, sometimes, usually studies will show somewhere between 60 and 80 percent of our water at home is being used on our lawns. And so we can make a big impact by changing that to native planting, right? Plants that are used that were here before we were here and that are used to the, the weather here, right? They can grow with the natural amounts of water that we see out here. So you go out to the desert, you'll see the creosote plants, which is actually a very medicinal plant. It smells amazing. So I just planted one of those in my yard, right? And took uh, the plants that I had there before out of it and just left the creosote. I water it in the winter probably once a month. And that's it. And it's happy. In the summer, it'll probably be, you know, every week or every two weeks. And so uh, these are, uh, and, and learning, you know, the planting methods as well, watering methods for desert plants. We're actually working on that now, uh, on w making a native planting guide for the Coachella Valley that lists over 60 different species of plants that we can use in our gardens and also has tips on how to plant them and how to take care of them. So hopefully we'll be getting that out here probably within the next year.
businesses, uh, looking at you know supporting businesses that that uh, that reduce their water use, right? And looking at different products. Uh, water bottles is one of the huge ones that I hope we can all move away from. Uh, water bottles can use up to three liters just for the plastic production. So there's a lot of water use that we don't really see up front, but it's happening behind the scenes, right? I've worked in manufacturing before, so a lot of these processes are, are very water intensive. Uh, T-shirts can use up to 2,700 liters of water because you have to grow that cotton too, right? And so uh, even in gasoline, you'll use 2.5 gallons of water to refine one gallon of gasoline. So every time you're using one gallon of gas, you're using 2.5 gallons of water there. So I think that's just another reminder that we, I think as a society, we just need to reduce our consumption in general, right? <laughs> in different products and learning how to get a reusable product. You know, I got my water bottle here with me all the time. I never use plastic water bottles and just trying to reuse everything we have as, as responsibly as we can. Uh, that's for the city to answer. <laughs> I'm not going to. That's a different conversation. <laughs> I think they had like a three-hour city council meeting on that one. So, question. So, biodegradable products, uh, for example, there are biodegradable soaps, right? If anybody's ever used Dr. Bronner's soap, they use all natural products in their, in their uh, process. And so that's kind of what I use. I just found an, a new laundry detergent. I believe the brand is Oasis. And so that is actually approved to be able to use in your garden. So even if you're growing fruits and vegetables, the runoff, so my washing machine goes straight into, the line goes straight into my garden, right? So I can wash some clothes and be confident that that water can go into my garden and it'll be clean and safe. So if it's clean and safe for me, I'm pretty sure it's clean and safe for the environment, right? And so just looking for different products like that that don't uh, include any, you know, if, if you're reading the label and you can't understand half of it, which I can't understand a lot of them, and I'm a chemist. So <laughs> I, I usually try to look for uh, just brands that use natural products and are sticking to things that are not going to be harmful to our environment. Uh, so we'll move on to some conservation efforts. How can we help our local wildlife as well? Uh, learning about our wildlife, I think, is one of the most important things that we can do. Uh, where do they live? What do they eat? Uh, what are their threats, right? And I think when we learn about how they live and, and what they need to survive, then we really start understanding what we can do to help them, right? Uh, one of the species that we have out here is a desert tortoise. You know, when I was younger, I didn't even know we had desert tortoises out here, but they're out there in the wild. And so one of the things that I've learned it, just in the past couple of months is that ravens are a huge threat to desert tortoises. And that's because when they're small, they still have very soft shells. And so the ravens can, can eat them while they're still small. And so what are ravens attracted to? It's mostly human trash. So the more trash that we have out in our desert, the more ravens that we're going to attract and the less tortoises we're going to see in our desert, right? So making those connections, and we can make those connections by learning more about how they live, where they live, and what they need to survive. Native planting, as we mentioned, brings a lot of conservation efforts. I think if we do that in our neighborhoods, we can start switching the conversation from conserving the mountains and conserving deserts that are outside of our neighborhoods and really bring that conversation into our neighborhoods and saying, how do we reproduce those animals here? How do we create our environments here for the local wildlife, our local bird species, right? If we plant the native plants as well, the, the California found palms, right, that if you leave them untrimmed, that's the habitat. If you trim that palm tree, you're getting rid of most of the habitat that's produced by it. So if we really wanted to create habitats, leave those palm trees untrimmed, uh, we can start growing the mesquites. Uh, some of the mesquite species that used to grow in groves out here are now pretty much gone. They're pretty hard to find. There's very few places where you can find groves of mesquite out in the wild. So to me, that's kind of, uh, I planted those too, right? <laughs> so looking for uh, issues like that that we see in the wild and starting to plant them in our neighborhood so that you know one, once we have these conservation, we might have a conservation effort to go uh, replant some of these plants in, in some areas of the desert, but where are we going to find the seeds, right? And so now we're working on how do we start supplying those plants into our cities, into our neighborhoods, so that we have those resources later when those conservation efforts come up, and we're just creating those habitats that we used to create outside of our, our cities and create them inside of our cities now. And they also use less water, so at the same time, the way I see it, if we plant a mesquite tree at the right angle of your house, you'll provide shade, reduce your, your consumption of energy, 
So you're reducing your carbon emissions, you're shading your house, you're saving money, you're using less water, conserving the water, and you're creating natural habitat. So it's three points that we can kind of take care of with just planting you know, trees, native trees in our neighborhoods. Preserving habitat is also very important, you know, res being responsible when we're camping and hiking, not going off of our trails. Sometimes we see it as harmless, right, but you could step on a little mesquite that's growing out there and kind of, uh, that's, that's it, right? That's, you kind of ruin his chances for survival. So being responsible, staying on our trails, being careful when we're camping, off-roading also, controlling that to areas that are supposed to be uh, designated for off-roading, and always controlling our illegal dumping which we know is a huge issue, and we do do a lot of work. Our volunteers do a lot of work in cleaning up some of those areas, so we're really grateful for them. Environmental careers, what careers could you choose if you wanted to help our environment? Education is very important, right? Right now we see a huge shortage of teachers out in our community, but science and math teachers are very important for us in helping our students um, really being able to understand these equations that we're talking about, right? Like those water equations, if kids can't get through their general math education, we're not gonna be able to get people who know how to deal with these issues, right? So teachers are very important. Professors who handle research at our universities, uh, UCR works closely with us, and they're able to help us along with those conversations. They actually just taught me recently that a lot of the species that we used to see at low levels of the desert are now moving up higher because of the temperature. It's too hot down here now, so they're moving a little higher, and they're starting to see you know, different habitats being formed now. So. Professors are very important to us. Environmental educators, people like us, right, who are out here uh, just trying to spread the word to the community and able to get the word out in a way that our community can understand and digest and be able to form their new habits to be help to help our environment. Environmental scientists, people who are testing our water quality, people who are going to be out there testing the salt and sea water to see what's really in it, uh, monitoring our climate change impacts, as we mentioned, and studying and protected our endangered. Uh, species here. Oops, sorry. Uh, businesses, right? Environmental careers can also be business careers. Uh, creating those sustainable products that we mentioned earlier, sustainable food, sustainable clothing, sustainable organic agriculture, also great things. Great things to support as well, even if you're not in that business, supporting those businesses. Uh, creating that demand is going to create more businesses coming onto line, right? So we have to create that demand on our end if we want to see more of those businesses taking action. And also governments, city councils, county supervisors, uh, state assembly, Congress, environmental protection agency, these are all people who are at the top making the final decisions on how we're gonna move forward and deal with these issues as well. So we always wanna encourage people to seek out those positions if you're, um, if you're inclined to, if you have the, the time and effort to do it and be able to help in that way as well. And of course, many other opportunities out there. So that's all I have for you today. Um, again, thank you for joining us. My name is Oscar Ortiz with De Friends of the Desert Mountains. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And if you'd like to support us, you know, our volunteers are in the back, can answer any questions about our organization. Thank you. Have a good day. Thanks.